This season, I'm partnering with Ultra Game, an officially licensed apparel product of the NFL. Stick around until the end of the video to learn more about how you can get great, team-specific clothing at an affordable price, and potentially win a giveaway for one of their products. December 17, 1972. The Atlanta Falcons are playing the Kansas City Chiefs, and what's about to transpire on the field on this day at Atlanta Stadium is one of the most well-known, funniest, and bizarre incidents in the history of the Falcons, and maybe the history of the league. The Chiefs won this game 17-14, but we don't really care about that. We care about this man right here, running back Dave Hampton. At this point in their short but unsuccessful history, the Falcons had never had a thousand yard rusher. In his first season with the team, Hampton entered the scheme with 930 yards, needing just 70 yards to become the first Falcon to ever cross this milestone. And against the Chiefs, he did just that, picking up 71 yards and officially going over the thousand yard mark. The fans went nuts, and the game was stopped to honor his accomplishment, with Hampton even being presented with a trophy and a game ball. It was a touching moment. And then, he got another carry, proceeded to lose 6 yards, and finished the season with 995 yards, meaning that the ceremony and the celebration was all for naught. The Falcons literally stopped the game and made a big deal out of him breaking this milestone, only for something to happen afterwards that said, yeah, this didn't happen. You might have thought you crossed the mark and got the record, but you didn't. Now, as hysterical as an incident is, it's pretty well known and publicized. But the one in this video, not as much. Because what you might not realize is that this was not the only time in a game involving the Falcons that a player thought he broke a record, and they celebrated his accomplishment, only for the player to realize afterwards that he didn't actually break the record, and didn't do what he thought he did. Because in a 1999 game, between the Atlanta Falcons and the Tennessee Titans, while everyone was celebrating the accomplishments of Javon Kurse, as it turns out, he didn't actually accomplish that feat. And the justification and reasoning for why his celebration got overturned is one of the weirdest things I've heard in quite some time. This is the story behind the crazy controversy of the 1999 NFL season involving Tennessee Titans defensive end Javon Kurse and his quest at history. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, and just how stupid everything was regarding it, we need some context to understand just who Javon Kurse was, how he was playing entering this point, and what he was trying to accomplish to etch his name into NFL history. The year is 1999, and the Tennessee Titans desperately, and I mean desperately, need help at pass rusher. They only had 30 sacks, which was only better than the Cincinnati Bengals and Chicago Bears in that category in 1998. Not a single player on the team recorded more than four sacks in 1998, and only one lineman, Josh Evans, even had more than three sacks. On top of that, they shockingly lost defensive lineman Anthony Cook in free agency, as even though the Titans were within striking distance of bringing him back, to the point where it was practically a foregone conclusion that he would return, he sent the team for a loot when he signed with Washington instead. You can learn more about that bizarre mess by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And because of this, they drafted the man that you've been watching this whole time. This is Florida defensive end Javon Kurse, and the Titans chose him with the 16th pick in the first round of the 1999 NFL Draft. Since this was 1999 that we were talking about, the Titans were hoping he could bolster up their pass rush more than Lenny Kravitz was hoping that he could fly away. He had a great career on some awfully good Florida teams, recording 34.5 tackles for a loss and 16.5 quarterback sacks. So if he could bring that production over with him to the pros, then the Titans might be in good shape. It's safe to say that the Titans had high hopes for him. But I don't think anyone, not even the most optimistic Titans fan or coach out there, and not even any sick person who's a fan of both Florida and the Titans, could have seen 1999 coming. Because in 1999, Javon Kurse was on another level. There had been a lot of rookies on the defensive side of the ball to come into the NFL and immediately look like a star. Heck, we saw that this past season in 2021 with the Dallas Cowboys and Micah Parsons. He stepped onto the field and immediately looked like one of the best defenders out there. But in the history of the NFL, the entire century-long history, I'd say there were only two times where a defensive player in his rookie season had a legitimate claim for being the best defender period in the league, where they came in right away and were right off the bat 
the top defender in football. One of them was Lawrence Taylor in 1981 with the New York Giants, who was so good that he won Defensive Player of the Year as a rookie. If you want to learn more about his rookie season and how the Giants drafted him in a somewhat controversial manner, click the card in the upper right corner. But the other man? Javon Kurse. If you said in 1999 that Javon Kurse was the best defender in the NFL, honestly, I'm not sure anyone would have batted an eye. He was that good. He was so good that out of 50 possible votes for Defensive Rookie of the Year, he won 49 of them, with the other vote going to Champ Bailey. He finished second in the voting for AP Defensive Player of the Year, only behind defensive tackle Warren Sapp of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, with just six votes separating the two players. If just four ballots flipped from Sapp to Kurtz, then Kurtz would have been just the second rookie, alongside the aforementioned Lawrence Taylor, to win this award. He was chasing guys down on the field left, right, and center, as he was faster than most halfbacks and wide receivers on the field, to the point where a running back could be 10 yards past the line of scrimmage, and you would still expect Kurtz to pop up somewhere at the bottom of the screen and come in and make the tackle. He led the league in forced fumbles, stripping guys eight times, which at the time, tied the NFL record, only done by Roy Barker in 1997 with the San Francisco 49ers, Tony Brackens during that same 1999 season with the Jacksonville Jaguars, and the legendary Derek Thomas in 1992 with the Kansas City Chiefs. He was named to the Pro Bowl and was named the first team All-Pro by the Associated Press. Any honor you threw his way, he not only got, but he wholeheartedly deserved because he was that good, and his tape was so much fun to watch. Most of the time, when a guy draws comparisons to Lawrence Taylor, they're outrageous. Curse was the one guy that you could honestly say was in Taylor's league, because in many ways, as a rookie, on the field, he was looking like Lawrence Taylor 2.0. And he was so good as a rookie that he was on the verge of breaking the NFL record for most sacks ever recorded by a rookie in NFL history. At the time, the record was held by Reggie White, who had 13 sacks with the Philadelphia Eagles in 1985, although you can put an asterisk next to that because he started off in the USFL, so he wasn't a rookie in the traditional sense. And after this play right here in Week 15 against the Atlanta Falcons, where he sacked Danny Cannell in the first quarter for a loss of eight, Curse was at 12 and a half sacks. One more sack, and he's got the coveted record. One more sack, and he etches his name in NFL history as the man with the most sacks ever by a rookie. And yes, Titans fans were happy that they won this game 30-17, but they were especially happy when in the third quarter, with the Titans leading at 20-17, and the Falcons facing third and 11, this happened. Third quarter, we've talked about how fast Javon curses. Watch this, Tony Graziani, bad sack, forget it. <laughs> forget about it, Tony Graziani. With the sack, Curse breaks the NFL rookie record for sacks. He breaks it. History was made. It didn't even take him 14 full games to do it. But Javon Curse had broken the NFL record for most sacks ever by a rookie. The freak was freaking incredible all season and was rewarded for it with a piece of history. And after the game, Curse, while being humble and thanking his teammates and coaches for the record, said on what this meant to him, hopefully, I'll just try to improve it some and just give the next rookie he tries to get the record something to look forward to. With two games to go, Curse had the record, and from an individual stat perspective, the question was simple. How high could he go? Just how far could he go to extend his lead and make it even more difficult for another rookie to do this? There was just one small problem. There was just one teeny tiny problem with this. Yeah, Curse didn't break the record. That didn't happen. Because as it turned out, the NFL statisticians made a pretty big error. Before we go any further, a clip from Seinfeld. The tradition of Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people. Now, you're gonna hear about it. Now, you might have a very valid question. Aside from the fact that Seinfeld is an awesome show, why the heck did you show that clip? Well because Festivus is the airing of grievances. And this Falcons-Titans game took place on December 19th, just a few days before Festivus on December 23rd. And after the game, presumably on December 23rd, Falcons head coach Dan Reeves called up the Elias Sports Bureau, the stat keepers for the NFL, and he had a lot of problems with them. Because in his eyes, that play on 3rd and 11? 
The play that Curse broke the record on? That wasn't a passing play. According to Reeves, that was a running play, meaning that in actuality, Curse got a tackle for a loss, and not a sack. Now you might be wondering why the heck Reeves was so frustrated about this, and why he was even calling to complain. Was it a ploy to try and prevent Curse from getting the record, and to have Reggie White hold on to it? Well, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Reeves was never on the same team as White, and Reeves viewed Curse in incredibly high regard. Reeves literally gave Curse the highest honor you can give a defender, and said after the game, you have to account for him. He's one of those Lawrence Taylor types where you have to make sure you take care of him. Here was a head coach who made it to four Super Bowls, including the most recent one, and clearly knows what he's doing, claiming that Curse is like Lawrence Taylor, arguably the greatest defender of all time. So I don't think it was a ploy at all. Honestly, I genuinely don't know why he would be upset about this and take the time out of his day, especially during the holiday season when he is a busy man and has got a game to plan for, to make an argument for why that sack should not count and should be a running play instead of a passing play. And it's especially puzzling because when you look at the tape, I have no clue how you can even make the argument that this was going to be a running play. It was 3rd and 11, so that's a passing down all the way. Maybe you could say he was going to call a halfback draw to try and get 5 or 6, and then was going to go for it, since you're right at midfield. And I might get that if it's the 4th quarter, but it's the 3rd quarter and it's only a 3 point game, so I don't think Reeves was going to do that. They're lined up like it's a passing situation, as more often than not, teams are throwing out of a set with 3 wide receivers out wide and a quarterback in the shotgun especially with 11 yards to go. But Reeves argued heavily to Elias that this play was not a sack, and instead was an 11-yard loss. Whatever argument Reeves made, somehow, it was highly convincing. Because guess what happened later in the week after Festivus and the airing of grievances, of which Dan Reeves probably had many? The play was overturned! That's right. All those celebrations and interviews and stories about Javon Curse breaking the record they were all meaningless and were all for nothing, because this was now going down as a tackle for a loss. Considering how bad the Falcons were in 1999, this was just about the only victory that Dan Reeves had all year, as meaningless as it was. But this breaking of the record was a false alarm. Seymour Siwoff, the president of the Elias Sports Bureau, said on the move, This is not unique. This happens every week. What makes this unique is this guy was in the process of setting a rookie record. And head coach Jeff Fisher took somewhat of a high road, saying that Reeves was telling the truth, even if he didn't believe him for one iota of a second. As Fisher said, My feeling was it was 3rd and 11 with three receivers on the field, and they were down three points, and quarterback Tony Graziani was in a shotgun, and the ball was snapped. I was a little disappointed with the timing, especially with the impact it had on the record, and recognition that Javon had. But like I said, Fisher tried to take the high road, saying, Coach Reeves said it was a run. I respect Dan, and if he said it was a run, then I'm sure it was a run. Fisher then added, Dan's honorable. The fact of the matter is, I think you can make a case both ways on the tape. Fisher just said a whole lot of nothing, but regardless, the sack was off the board, and Curtis was stuck at 12 and a half sacks, still needing one sack to break the record. But as it turns out, the whole controversy was meaningless at the end of the day. Because one game later, in Week 16 against the Jacksonville Jaguars, this happened. Following the penalty, this will be the first half's final play. Oh, and he's sacked! Javon Curse, the number one sack man in the AFC. There was no debating that one. Now, it was officially official. Take two, this time for real. Now, Javon Curse had the all-time record for most sacks in a season by a rookie, and would finish the season with 14 and a half sacks, which even in a 17-game season today, still stands as the record for most sacks by a rookie. And while Curse could never replicate the success that he had in 1999, where he did all of that and guided the Titans to their first Super Bowl in franchise history, after they beat a team in the AFC Championship that shall remain nameless, he had a great NFL career nonetheless, making three Pro Bowls, having 74 sacks, and being one of the most feared defenders in football at his peak. But he might have one of the weirdest record-breaking moments in the history of the NFL. He thought he broke the record, then the NFL told him that he didn't, and then 
he came right back and broke it again. And today, even if it took a weird path to get the record, many people remember this Titan as the greatest defensive rookie in NFL history. I don't think it can be denied that in the prime of his career, Javon Kirst made life uncomfortable for opposing quarterbacks. But do you want to know what makes life really comfortable? Ultra Game, an officially licensed product of the NFL, who I'm partnering with this season to give you guys an opportunity to get your hands on some of the best and comfiest apparel out there. Ultra Game has officially licensed products for all 32 teams. From t-shirts to tank tops, to long sleeve shirts to hoodies, to shorts to fleece pants and everything in between, Ultra Game has it all, and at incredibly affordable prices too. They were kind enough to send me this incredibly nice and incredibly comfy shirt for me to rep the Jaguars all season, and I absolutely love it, as it's so soft and fits perfectly. If you want to get your hands on apparel like that, all you have to do is use my link in the description. Not only do you get some sweet merch, but if you use my link, it helps the channel out a lot. And that's not all, because from now until July 23rd, if you like this video, subscribe to my channel and Ultra Game, whose channel you can go to by either clicking the link in the description, or by clicking the card in the upper right corner, and you comment below on what your favorite team or player is, then one lucky fan is going to win one of these awesome t-shirts. You must be in the United States to win. So special thanks to Ultra Game for hooking me up this NFL season, and special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so yeah, how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.